Welcome to the Retirement Roadmap by SHP Financial, a podcast empowering today's retirees and pre-retirees to make well-informed financial decisions that will help you spend more time living and dreaming than worrying and wondering. Join me, Matthew Peck, along with my co-hosts, Derek Gregoire and Keith Ellis, as we share actionable financial strategies and insights, as well as interview top thought leaders in the world of finance, accounting, and estate planning. This is all aimed at preparing you for the retirement you've always dreamed of. Our high quality holistic planning process has helped thousands of families retire and create what we like to call the ripple effect. The Retirement Roadmap is your guide to financial freedom. Are you ready to get started? Let's go. Welcome, everyone, to the Retirement Roadmap podcast brought to you by SHP Financial. I'm Derek Gregoire, joined with Keith Ellis. Uh, Matt's out today, but the two of us are holding down the fort, and we want to introduce you to a special guest, a good friend of ours for well over a decade now, uh, Brad Johnson. And Brad is one of the principals at Triad, which is a firm that works with, helps develop uh, hundreds of advisors. And as we get into the conversation, you'll kind of see how it relates to retirement planning in general. But Brad was instrumental in our growing of SHP Financial over the years. And uh, so without further ado, welcome to the show, Brad. What's up, guys? Glad to be here. How you doing out there? How's Kansas? Kansas, the (laughs) Kansas City metro area is very solid this week. Um, You may have heard of the team called the Chiefs. They're in the Super Bowl. Oh, we're not going to uh, go up this Sunday. So Forget it's, I it's a that. good, you know, I know you all have to, when the Patriots had their glorious decade run, you had to kind of share that with me. So I figured I would just make sure you guys were up to up to date on the current sports events. But the difference is Keith and I could name more than three people on the Patriots. Just remember that. <laughs> I'm open to the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, well, I, the question, the question is, could you now? Y- yes, yes, I could. That's, funny. that's a good question. <laughs> so back, so back. Let's fast forward back to almost around 2010, 11, well over ten, you know, 15, almost 13, 14 years ago or so. Um, we had started our firm, SHP Financial, in 2003, and um, one of the things that you know we thought we were growing a firm. We were growing the firm. It was obviously very slow and steady. You know, Keith was. We were both in our 20s at that point, um, early 20s actually, in, in early 2000s when we started SHP. And then we started getting a little bit of growth over the years and building up our clientele. But um, really, it was a pivotal point when we met and really started getting things going around 2011, 12, 13. Um, but back, fast back to that time period, obviously, we were much younger, probably less wrinkles, a little more hair. Well, not for you. You had less hair. Not gray. Yeah. I had less hair back then. That's true. <laughs> yeah, you did. Um, Brad was coming off as, I th- you believe you were an All-American D2 football player? I appreciate you sliding the D2 in there. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, just, that's accurate. I will say, though, <laughs> on a quick side note, when we first met, I thought I was a pretty good athlete, and I tried to cover Brad like in my backyard running a route, and I was like, wow, he is pretty fast. So I'll give him that. I don't know if he still has those wheels, but... Wow. Frame that, uh, they're um, frame they're that disappearing right uh, quickly, but I, 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 at least you know better a has been than it never was. The wheel is a little rusty, go. yeah, a little wobbly at this point. <laughs> yeah, they're wobblier by the minute. Yeah, exactly. So even back then, so you know, as you've helped a lot of advisors, just I guess as a general landscape of the advisor advisory world, right? You've seen it all. You've seen good, the bad, the ugly, the in between. So um, I guess just share because a lot of our listeners are. Either either working with us or know a little bit about us, but I guess just in the generation, gener- in general, like advisory firms, what does it look like and why is it so different? Because a lot of people think, well, they're all the same. You know, if my advisor, this advisor, it's all the same. And once they, once they meet with different firms, they realize it's totally not the case. But what have you seen over the years? I guess, how can you frame up the, the landscape as, as best as possible? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to, that short short question, big answer, but I'll try to summarize it. And I know you all are working with a lot of Boston area retirees. And then, of course, as they retire and relocate and go different places, uh, really retirees all over the country now. Um, but my, my journey into finance, um, as you said, I played football in college. I was an IT major. And my first job right out of college was uh, the infamous Payless Shoe Source that no longer exists. So I was in corporate America for about three years. Before I just realized, um, you know, I I had a different calling. I'd always been interested in finance and like 
Now, I remember buying Google and Chipotle and Under Armour when they IPO'd. I was at, in my first corporate job. And so I was really taking the path to very similar to you all, um, to a captive, you know, kind of advisory space, which is what attracts a lot of, I think, young advisors fresh, fresh out of college. And um, I was really fortunate. Uh, one of the, what became the largest, one of the largest insurance brokerage companies and RIAs in the independent space was in my own backyard here in Topeka, Kansas. And I got that job when I was 26 years old. And my job was to work with advisors all across the country, independents. And we can talk maybe about the difference between independent and captive, because my guess is a lot of retirees don't know there is such a difference. Yeah. Um, but I remember to fast forward, I remember one of my biggest ahas. This was really young in my career. I remember thinking of financial advisors very similar to how you'd think about a doctor. You know, here's a professional. You walk into their office and you've got this problem or these symptoms of a problem and they diagnose it and they offer you professional help. And that was very much the lens that I looked through in the financial advisory space as a 26-year-old when I first got into this business. That was 2007. Um, And I remember I got on a phone call and we were a, a brokerage company and there was a product that I'll call it the litmus test for ethics in finance yeah. because it was, um, it was three products. They were all the same product. So think of it for, if you're a retiree listening in out there, it was a five year, just a fixed annuity. Think CD very much like a CD, just very boring fixed rate product. But this, this was a interesting one doesn't exist anymore, but, um, it was basically think of it like a teeter totter. And on one side was the fixed rate it paid the client, you know, I think it was like 1%, 3%, 5% per year. So that was one side. Yep. On the other side of the teeter-totter was the commission that it paid wow. that advisor. And so it was kind of like 5, 3, 1. And so basically, if you paid the client 5%, the advisor made 1. And it was like 3 and 3 was in the middle. And then, um, you know, if you paid 1, the advisor made the high commission. And that's a, that's a fiduciary a nightmare. Test. That's a fiduciary nightmare right there. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, this product doesn't even exist, um, but back in 2007, it did. Wow. And it was um, inc- incredible and scary to me, unfortunately, at the time, how many um, advisors, insurance agents picked the high commission at the detriment of their clients. And I know, you know, your all's journey um, through the captive group that you came in, you had a set shelf of limited products that you all were offered, but you didn't know any better at the time. It was yeah. just kind of like, here's what we were trained as 20 something year olds to, to basically offer our clients and you were just doing the best you could. So that was kind of the, the first eye opener to me when I first got in the industry that, you know, there are, there are, call it salespeople and there are financial planners and the, they aren't all created equal. So I won't go on too long, but that was, that was kind of the first story where I remember like, ah, oh, this is, this is not what I expected. Well, Keith, remember, we start, that's where Keith and I and Matt met at, in 2001, 2002. We were at a captive company that you were only allowed to offer their stuff, if you will. Like whatever they offered, you had to offer. Yeah, you had a, you had a shelf of four or five different products. And you went to Mr. and Mrs. Jones's house and you tried to fit that uh, square peg in a round hole or that shoe on that foot, even though it wasn't the right size. That That's how you were, that's how you're trained, in my opinion, in some of these captive agencies and that's like Derek said that's where you know where we started which I think was a good place to start because it kind of gives you yeah I guess in my opinion the worst side of the industry 100% you kind of and then you all of a sudden like you you go into every job with just a hammer and a wrench so if something needs if the windows need cleaning you gotta hit it with a hammer right so it's like it doesn't make sense I would use the wrench yeah (laughs) yeah Keith would definitely use the wrench um but I think when that so that's why in 2000, people are like, why did you start? How did you start so young, you know, 23, 24, 25 years old? Because in 2003, we'd already been working for that company for a year or two. And I realized this is, we didn't, once we realized there was a lot more options out there that were better for the clients, it was like, all right, we have to move on. We don't know what that looks like, but we have to move on. Yeah, I would say this uh, company kept a pretty good, um, tabs, pretty good way or, you know, blind, pretty they were pretty good at keeping the blinders on, keeping the curtain down so we couldn't look behind it to, to know that there were other products or other opportunities or that were actually 
a heck of a lot better for our investors, our clients, and the people that we served. And uh, once, like like Derek said, once we found out that there was, because we were young, naive, tr- coming out of college, just thirsty to learn the industry, and then to be thrown into that environment, it was, like I said, a very, very important learning experience. But, you know, looking back on it, it's like, oh, you know, you wish you had known everything so you could have done done better by the client. Yeah. It's like you didn't know what you didn't know. Exactly. Um, exactly. I had I had a, an advisor, and and this is one of the things, guys, that I was just for. Obviously, I met you guys a long time ago, and it was cool to really grow up in the business as you all evolved and grew your business, and were able to to serve a lot more clients in your marketplace, grow the team. Um, but that was in my chair. I kind of had this thirty thousand foot view. Um, you know, I personally was working with hundreds of financial services firms across the country. And then the, the company I worked for was working with thousands. Yeah. And so I, I just kind of say I had an accelerated learning curve. And so I could really see kind of the landscape of the independent financial advisory space. And I guess just to not assume when we say captive and independent, um, captive really, you know, how I would define that, it's kind of working for uh, a mothership. We've all seen the commercials on TV where it's, you know, this company or that company, there's another name over the door. Um, And versus independent, obviously, you all as entrepreneurs created and built SHP. And then typically a very defining difference between a captive organization in finance and an independent is the product selection. And one of the things, the analogies I heard one advisor share, he's like, you know, when you go into like a quick shop and you're like, you need some laundry detergent, and what what are your guys' quick shops on the East Coast? We've got like Cumberland you know, Farms, 7-11. maybe. Yeah, Seven Elevens up here. Seasons. Okay, so call, call it like a Seven Eleven. I go into a Seven Eleven. I'm in a pinch, and I need some laundry detergent. You're going to have like two options, maybe, and it's going to be the smaller bottle at the more expensive price, typically, right? Like the Tide or whatever they're carrying. And um, with the, with a captive group, that's just oftentimes what happens is it's like there's only so much bandwidth because they have to like train their group on distributing certain products. And so they can't train them on everything. So it's like, let's pick two or three and let's distribute those where the analogy of an independent advisor would be like going into Walmart and looking at what's that shelf space. When you look at laundry detergent, you're going to have everyone you've ever heard of and probably 15 you haven't. And um, because it's just what I would call open architecture when it comes to solutions. And I don't know if you guys want to go into kind of the concept of fiduciary yeah. um, and how that plays in, but I think those two kind of go hand in hand with independent captive and then fiduciary and how I think our industry markets that versus the definition. I think that might be helpful to your audience. I agree. And, and before we get into that, I would say, Brad, that the main, the evolution was first to, like you said, not just be captive to certain things to offer to clients. That's that was our decision back in two, that was 20 years ago in 2003. Mm-hmm. Then as we started building, it was like, great, we can offer anything and any, everything and anything to our clients, which is great. But then around 2010, 11, 12, we said, you know what? That's great, but that's only part of investment and income plan. That's only a, like a part of a financial plan. So I think the evol- involvement from after we met you in around 11 or so, um, like 12, 13, 14 was the, the growth in evolving in the SHP retirement roadmap. And instead of just mm-hmm. using, having the best access to all the investment tools, which, which we do and we did, then it was like, all right, well, that's one piece of the puzzle, but what are we doing for tax planning? How are we involving that into our clients' plans? Do we have a proper estate plan attorney to coordinate estate plans? How about Medicare, long-term care? When can I retire? When, Am I going to run out of money? This so there's decisions around Social Security, when to take exactly. it. You know what I mean? There's there's so much that goes into this. So I think as you as you mentioned is like that's when you when you're looking when someone's looking for an advisor, and as you mentioned is like there's captive versus independent, and then okay you're independent, but what do you really you do, what do you really do? Are you a small company that can only offer a few products and vehicles, but in you maybe even your fiduciary. But what are you actually really doing for that client from a full holistic planning perspective? So there's, it's really, it's like, you know, everyone could have a similar designation, but what that firm does for their clients, as you know, dealing with hundreds of advisors and or probably thousands over the years, it's very, very different. So 
back to the fiduciary conversation, Brad, obviously uh, we're held to the fiduciary standard, you know, act in the best interest of you, of your clients ahead of your own situation. Right. And some people almost market that if you watch yeah. commercials, it's like, yep, we're a fiduciary. That means you should come to us. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, guys, I literally just saw a commercial this weekend and my guess is many of the the retirees or soon to be retirees or whoever's listening to this podcast has seen the exact same commercial. Um, just write it down, write the word fiduciary down and then watch the next uh, financial services commercial. And I bet half of them are using it, but here's the thing. They're using it as a marketing angle versus the definition of what a fiduciary actually is. Yeah. And I, I just pulled it up because I wanted to get one definition um, a fiduciary is someone who manages money or property for someone else. When you are named a fiduciary, you are required by law to manage the person's money and property for their benefit, not yours. For example, a friend of yours may name you her fiduciary through a power of attorney. Um, so that's very short and sweet. Um, but here's what's interesting. Um, I've seen this, um, and by the way, a Series 65, we're getting a little into the weeds, but a Series 65 means, uh, which obviously the guys are Keith and Derek and, and their team, it allows you to charge a fee for financial planning. One of the things that comes along with is the requirement to be a fiduciary, right? Yes. So legally act in the best interest of your clients. So by definition, I'm legally obligated to act in the best interest of my clients. Now let's talk about the marketing spin that our industry puts on it. It's basically work with the fiduciary and no one else. Now, the problem is, I'm going to go back to your guys' analogy of the tools and the toolbox. And one of the things I've found to be very true, in fact, as I've talked with retirees, as I've talked with advisors, it's almost universal. And I'm just going to say, uh, you know, hey, I hire you to build a home for me. And if I'm the general contractor for your home and I open up my toolbox, I'm like, hey, guys, this is going to be an incredible home can't wait to build it. And I pull out a hammer. You're like, awesome. Cool. Yeah. We're going to have to hammer some nails in. Absolutely. But then if you look in the toolbox and all that's in there are hammers, you're like, Hey, uh, where's the rest of the tools and how sound of a structure are we going to be able to construct with just hammers? And that could trade out a hammer for a saw or a wrench or whatever. And so one of the things I see is there's this war it's almost like going on Facebook and scrolling right versus left, you know, <laughs> yeah. politics. But in the world of finance, it's fee-based versus insurance-based planning. And just swap those two terms out for here's a hammer on one side, here's a saw on the other. And truth be told, I strongly believe a fiduciary, if you're actually going to deliver on the term fiduciary, you should open up the toolbox and ideally have every financial product, every tool in this analogy possible in that toolbox to serve your clients. Yep. And I think one of the things that happens on a lot of these, whether it's, you know, I see it a lot in the AUM based world. Hey, we're a fiduciary. You know, we're legally obligated to do what's in your best interest. And then you're like, okay, cool. What sort of insurance planning do you do? And they're like, we don't do insurance planning. And you're like, wait, you work with retirees and how do you not have like life insurance options or income based solutions, annuities, other products that you can, you know, these are tools that were designed to solve for that need. But, or on the flip side, if you go on the insurance side and there's not fee based, it's like, wait, definitely get the protections that insurance allows. But my guess is they also want to grow some assets as well, keep up with inflation. Maybe they've got extra in the portfolio that they just want to grow that and aligns with their risk. Um, you know, tolerance, all that. And so like, if I'm just going to circle back, I think one of the things as a retiree, if somebody says, Hey, I'm a fiduciary, I'm obligated to do what's in your best interest. I would say, Hey, let's open up the toolbox yep. of tools. What all solutions do you offer? What are your insurance solutions? What are your fee-based solutions? And literally get, because you can say you're a fiduciary and you can legally be a fiduciary licensed to be one. The question is what's in the toolbox, because if they don't have the solutions in the toolbox or they haven't trained, been trained to offer, you know, a, a broad breadth of solutions, then it's like, I'm a fiduciary with one tool and we know how that works out. Right. So 
anyway, that's kind of the stance I've, I've looked at that I, that's been eye opening over the last 10, you know, 10, 15 years. Well, I would say those same things and that's really good points, Brad, but on the same token, like you have those same commercials and people that market that they're a fiduciary, right? But we, as soon as we get our 65, technically we were fiduciaries, right? Many, many years ago. So if we mm -hmm. just, this is how I always thought about it. And obviously this is the difference between the CFP standard maybe and being a fiduciary. But if you're a fiduciary and you can just put someone in a, like, let's say you, you run a commercial, people call, you do a risk questionnaire. Oh, you're moderate. Okay. You're going to go in our moderate portfolio. Done. That's being a, technically on paper, right? That's being a fiduciary. You have your license. They filled out a risk score. They, they end up moderate. You put them in a moderate portfolio. You rebalance it and you manage it. That's, it's good. My point is like what I think the biggest thing over that a good advisor, a good advisory firm, it's independent, differentiates themselves is having that just be one piece of the practice. What I always say is ask your advisor, what are you doing that you're not necessarily getting paid for? Right. It sounds like a crazy question. Like, well, obviously I'm going to pay someone to do the work, but like how, if you look at the SHP model, we're paid to manage clients' portfolios and so forth. But <clears throat> with that, we're also building clients have access to a full portal, an amazing technology suite, right? Not to, and this isn't to brag about us. I'm just saying they have a full plan on income, cash flow, taxes, healthcare, estate planning. All this is being like built out as a full plan. So I would take it one step further and say, because so many people that say they're fiduciaries, would never even have a conversation about proactive tax planning. And I'm not talking about tax returns. I'm talking about, hey, if the tax code looks like it might go up and you have a lot of money in IRAs and 401ks that you have paid zero dollars in taxes in, are we just going to let that sit and then deal with it when you're 73 years old and RMDs come out and next thing, and now it's putting you into a higher bracket, which might even be higher than it is now and your Medicare premiums might be higher. Is that being a fiduciary? I guess it is. But it, it, my point is that the, true advising needs to go so much more beyond that in my opinion it needs to go beyond stocks bonds mutual funds exactly it needs to be holistic like derek was saying you know you need and i always think of it as like five gears in like this retirement machine and all the gears need to be working together to make sure the plan is working income investments taxes healthcare, and legacy and if one of those gears is broken if one of those gears isn't up to date if one of those gears is not even being looked at then you don't have a full plan. That machine, like I said, is not working. I don't know if that's the best analogy, but that's kind of the way yeah. I, I use it. And Brad, you know, well, Keith, Matt, and myself, and Michelle, our, kind of our leadership team here, we've been working on the same team for 10 years almost in terms of that particular, since we hired Michelle as our COO. And we like mentally grind on ways to provide more value, right? And like, I think, um, and, and obviously it's a lot different than where it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, it takes firms a while to get to the point where they can offer true advice. But a lot of people will ask, you know, well, how come your team is so big? Why do you have 45, 50 people? And I think going back to that same thing, in order to deliver on a true fiduciary based plan, um, if you use a CFP model, which we have a lot of, you know, a few CFPs on our team here at SHP, um, that to get to have that planning, you need a planning team. You need a uh, team that can manage portfolios. You need an investment committee. You need an operations team. You need a new business team. You, you, you need, need business development. You need team. people to help you execute. Correct. It's really what it is. I could never on my own sit here and do the type of planning we offer to our clients if it was just me. There's, there's no way, unless yeah. I had like two clients, right? It, and it's impossible. So a lot of times, a lot of advisors get, they just keep scaling, 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 growing. If you're not growing your team to support that and building the value, then are you really providing the best value to your clients? You know what I mean? Mm hmm yeah, I, I think I borrowed this from you guys. Um, do you have a portfolio or do you have a plan? And, you know, if you look at what's very common um, based on many of the offices we work with nationwide is oftentimes a retiree will come into their office with, they've, they've done the work. They've done what they were supposed to do. They were diligent. They saved. They invested. And maybe they have half a mil. Maybe they have a mil. Maybe they have two mil or more. and in reality, once you peel back the onion, it's a basket of stocks yeah. that's, you know, diversified. Um, but the, the analogy I'll make a lot is, you know, many retirees are only seeing half of the picture. You know, if you say you've got this lifelong goal of I want to climb Mount Everest, you know, I want to make it to the peak. Many retirees do the same thing with their money. I want to 
I want to get a million dollars in the nest egg, two million in the nest egg. And it's kind of this big number that's like this goal, the summit in their mind. The thing is, once they make it to the peak, guess what? Mount Everest, you have to make it down to the base. And weird statistic is more people actually perish on the way down than the way up because they haven't adequately planned for the second half of the journey. I think it's a really interesting analogy when you look at retirees because they've worked on all the accumulation piece, which is the working years where, by the way, we have a recent market downturn like all of us have recently experienced here. Well, that's okay because I've got the paycheck and it just keeps, you know, I live off the paycheck in my working years. Well, once you retire... And now I've got the million dollar nest egg. If the million dollar nest egg is now an 800K nest egg or a 700K nest egg because of market exposure, uh uh-oh, as a retiree, I'm in trouble now. It's kind of hard to go back and retro fix that. And so as you guys look and you solve for income, you know there is no such thing as retirement without income. You need that foundational base. And most retirees, unfortunately, don't have pensions these days. So you create that income base. Then you've got the growth of investments on top of it. But guess what? We can do those two really well. And let's just say my imaginary advisor makes me an extra 5% per year compared to the guy down the road. Well, if I'm paying 20% more in taxes because I don't have a tax plan, <laughs> you know, proactive tax planning, none of that matters anyway. Exactly. So it all, to your guys' point, it all works together. And if you focus in on one or two of those pieces of the pie and ignore the other three, by the way, that can come back to bite you really hard. And so- As you guys have built out your team, one of the things that I've seen evolve is to build a true holistic financial plan built on a CFP standard and check all the boxes. It can't be done with the solo advisor because there's so much to take into account. Like your guy, Nick, that oversees the planning team. Yeah. I mean, that guy's like a black belt ninja in (laughs) e-money, your financial planning software for those that that aren't familiar. And um, it's just... It's insane to see the level we were talking uh, not that long ago last week. And he's going into scenarios that I've never even dreamed up and and testing for those. So to to your guys' point, you had to have a team if you were going to deliver on the promise of true holistic financial planning. And I I love that you guys have invested in your company to actually build out the team to in order to deliver on that. Well, I think you have to. And that's what we've, you know, you really have to to deliver that true plan that, and I think that's what leads to clients telling their friends and like the referrals it's, it's just doing the planning and doing what we say we're going to do from the beginning and living up to what we promised each client and one of the things i love doing an exercise right if we have a real plan right because if you're my my thought is if, like maybe i'm a little more like uptight in in uh ocd types i don't i don't want, i'm like if i'm on a vacation yeah, Derek, you are you are 100 <laughs> <100%. laughs> percent. but if i'm on, let's say i'm on vacation somewhere right and i'm retired Maybe, and maybe you could probably get away with this, Brad, but if I'm, I, I wouldn't be able to sit there and be like, you know, I have a good, like, if I feel like a lot of things in my retirement plan were not being taken care of, that could be, that weren't being fully looked at, or even around taxes. Like, if I, I have all this money in 401ks, no one's ever talked to me about taxes. That would just bother me, right? So I like to have, make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. From, for me, it's everything, but for everyone, it should be at least for your financial plan. And once you have a plan where everything is built out properly, the te- we, meaning we have a portal that, that lets our clients know what their income is going to be, what, what their social security, their work, their, their projected returns, right? Then, this is the cool part, what I love being able to do with our clients is showing them what's possible, right? Because a lot of times they say, you know, I would like to have, you know, it'd be great if I could do one vacation a year, you know, nothing too fancy because we don't want to spend our money down, but it'd be great if I could do one vacation a year, maybe bring our grandkids once every three years, and then we look at their plan. It's like, hey, Joe and Mary, do you know that you could do that every year, three times a year and still be fine? You know what I mean? They're like, what? So a lot of people, like you said, try to get yeah. to this number. Then they don't have a plan, so they're not sure how much they should be spending or what they can do. So it's like, I love being like, no, here's what you, here's covering your base plan is easy. And obviously every scenario is different, but this happens a lot. Here, however, here's what's possible. Here's what you could live off and still not worry about running out of money down the road. So that's cool to see to to, for clients to be able to see the impact of the planning that's allowing them to live their fullest life in retirement that's that's what we love we love seeing like the outcome of that type of scenario i love that um a mentor actually shared that question with me one time anytime you're faced with something ask yourself the question what what could this make possible so if i was a retiree listening in right now 
what could having like a super dialed in exactly. financial plan make possible? And I know one of the things um, we've talked a lot about is, you know, being an advisor, being a financial advisor by title, by licensing, hundreds of thousands of those in the United States of America. What most retirees need from my experience is somebody that helps lead their financial lives. Yep. They need leadership. They need mentorship. They need someone when it gets crazy, like the recent market conditions. Let's be honest, a therapist some days, you know, if, if I'm days. like waking up and I'm like, I'm stressed out, I can't sleep well at night. And what's, um, what's really cool to see um, how you guys approach it is you, you're helping retirees spend with confidence. But like, yeah, there, exactly. there's no worse travesty. I mean, I wasn't planning on sharing this story, but I'm going to share it because it just came to mind. My wife's grandma. So she was a Catholic school teacher her whole life. Um, and she grew up in the Great Depression. So she was the type that would literally, you know, like save the pennies and not a lavish lifestyle, tiny house, Salina, Kansas, um, not a high cost of living. And um, she was the type of Catholic that would go to church Wednesday, Sunday, probably slip a Saturday in there too, like multiple times a week. And her one goal in life was to go visit the Vatican in Rome, Italy. And unfortunately, she passed away, never checked off that bucket list item. And Sarah's mom, uh, my mother-in-law, like that just ate, ate away at her because that was like her mom's lifelong goal. She died with over $60,000 in the bank that was distributed to her kids. And so that, that to me is like the saddest retirement story. Yeah. Of yeah. The, the funds were there. Um, she could have taken multiple. She could have taken the most yeah. lavish trip to Italy ever. And because the planning was not in place, because the prioritization was not in place, because she, it was kind of like, well, this what, a, what if rainy days. I'm here to tell you, you guys do this all the time. It's possible with proper planning to say, hey, here is the vacation fund every year. It's like almost contractually locked in. You don't have to think about it. The market goes up, down, sideways. Yep. It's literally built into the planning. And to me, like if, if I'm a retiree out there and this is my own personal view, like there's a reason you you work hard during your years and you know raising the kids and grinding. I've got three kiddos at home. I know some days it's like, man, this is just a grind. And I had uh, somebody once tell me the days are long and the years are short Definitely. And as a parent. And um, I want to make sure once my wife and I are empty nesters and we have a lot of traveling aspirations, I will absolutely have a plan in place that it isn't even second thought. It's like, where are we going this month? Where are we going next month? And um, the cool thing is with proper financial planning, and I know we've shared some of these stories privately, like not only is it possible, to your point, Derek, you said some people are like, well, every three years, you're like, no, the math works out. You could take three of these trips a year if yeah, you wanted. Exactly. Because th the planning's in place, right? And so just clarity is the key. And I think that's awesome. You guys provide that by having proper planning in place. And we, I'll share, I know we got to run soon. We, I'll share one of the story that was pretty impactful that, we had a client spend with us a few years and when they when they came on board we kind of went through the scenario of what's possible and they actually retired in their 50s it was pretty cool they retired early and on that theme of of what's possible they had went on a trip and i don't remember where i went. It might have been italy but it was wherever they ended up there was a spot where they took some sort of a tram or something to the top of the mountain and then for the last quarter you know i don't want to say quarter mile there was a certain amount of steps you had to get to the very very top to this peak ultimate view right and so as they were about to go up they met this couple that was older than them in their late 70s and they're talking to the couple like hey they get to know each other they had these last several steps to get to this top peak and they said hey let's go up together you know let's let's do this together and this older couple said no we're not gonna be able to make it come on let's go and they, and they said you know what if i had one regret i wish we we, had, we were so nervous about running out of money that we waited to travel so long mm -hmm. that now that we're here, we physically can't get to the top. And so yeah. kudos to you, as they were saying to our clients, for actually taking the time and making, he's crying, taking the time and getting it to the top because, um, you know, in all seriousness, that was like, they, they took it to heart. And I remember I, that was a story I heard many years ago and it, it stuck with me. Like, 
you know, don't wait. And obviously some people just flat might not be able to afford it. But if you have a financial yeah. plan in place and you're able to do so, or you're not sure, make sure you're having that conversation of what is possible because you get, you know, you get one life. And like you said, it's a quick one. And, uh, you know, whatever it is that you want to do, charities you want to support, whatever it is, could be charities, could be uh, mission trips, could be travel, could be grandkids, could be golf, could be all of the above. It's it, you, you want to know what's possible. And that's what I think, you know, should sit with everyone. And to, to know what's possible, it doesn't just take having all the products and having all the options. It doesn't just, you know, being independent versus captive. To me, it takes true financial planning, not just fiduciary, take it one step further, income, investments, taxes, healthcare, estate planning. So um, any yeah, last... Well, the, sorry, the truth is, Derek, you can't take it with you. Yeah. So either make sure you leave it behind to a person, a cause, church, charity, to your point, or you should probably spend it while you're here and enjoy it. Um, to me, money is just a vehicle that allows you to create experiences with those that you love. It's just a tool. And um, I had a... Uh, one of my clients, actually, this was like 10 years ago on that exact conversation. He says, my goal is to retire a little bit more each year, not slave away for 40 years and then not, you know, be, be the couple that can't make it all the way up the, the mountain in Italy. That was the bucket list thing, but just, and it's easy. I mean, it's possible um, with proper planning is as a 50 some year old, 40 some year old, you can start creating those experiences and they can just be long weekends starting out you know, as you grow the nest egg, but, um, it's all about priority and putting the big rocks on the calendar that matter. Yeah. And on the don't wait front, I had a client call me when we were out on our, uh, adventure and he had a heart attack and unfortunately, you know, thank God now recovered. But when I met with him three years ago and have continued to meet with him ongoing, he just wanted to push, push, push through work. And I said, you need to take some time and enjoy life and enjoy, you know, what are some things you always wanted to go to the Amalfi Coast, Italy. I know we've talked a lot about mm -hmm. Italy, really promoting that vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Italy, uh, Italy owes us Amalfi money. Amalfi Coast, he should go yesterday. Yeah. It's amazing. So needless to say, he goes through his heart surgery um, and then calls me and he goes, Keith, I need to take some money out of the accounts. I'm finally going to listen to you. And I said, you know, there's, you know, you can't get back health. You can't get back time. You got to do it while you can. So we sent, we sent out the check late last week and I can't wait to get the pictures. Yep. I love it. Our most finite, finite resource. And I think a lot of people think it's money. It's time. Definitely yeah. time. And, and, you know, you talk to somebody that's in poor health or towards the end of their journey on this planet. And they'll all say, I'd spend all the money in the account to get my health back or time back. Yep. Absolutely. And so. Don't take it for granted while you got it. That's for sure. Well, even though you bashed me about being uptight, even though I was the one who brought it up, you're not supposed to agree with me. Um, we do appreciate, I, I know too. all these, yeah, I'm going to get him back later. All these years of, um, and I, you know, back in the day, I know you had, you had really uh, believed in us long term and saw a vision of our company. We were just six or seven of us here. Um, so obviously we, we really appreciate that and all the support ongoing and, um, uh, your friendship and everything else means a lot to us. So thank you. Well, guys, on, on my side, it's it's been an awesome journey. Uh, we all met each other as 20-something-year-olds, um, you know, young in this business. And it's been, I feel really, really fortunate to have been able to just be beside you guys watching the journey play out. And um, one of the things, you know, I have an opportunity to work with hundreds of financial services offices over, you know, 15 years now. I'm not the young guy in the business anymore. Um, one thing that always stood out with just SHP, I know I've got the two of you and Matt, Michelle, and you've got a great team around you all. Um, it was just the heart, um, the heart you guys cared. Um, and that's something you can't fake. And that I believe if I really look at where all of this came from and how it's evolved, you guys cared, you cared more about your clients and retirees than you did, you know, trying to, you know, make this or that. It was just like, it's a testament to like the, um, Zig Ziglar, you help enough other people get what they want, you'll get what you want. And to me, that's been SHP's journey is it's just a testament of you've helped a lot of retirees in your marketplace, you know, get those goals checked off for their retirement. And because of that, your company has grown and benefited. So humbled to have been along for the ride. And I appreciate all the kind words and, and you guys give me a lot of credit. But the truth is, it was, it was all your guys's vision and 
and caring about retirees and your team and, you know, letting it, letting it go from there. So we appreciate it. Thanks for having me on guys. This was a fun conversation as always. Yeah. Awesome. We'll catch up with you soon, bud. Thank you. Can I, I've got one favor to ask. Yes. As we wrap here. Um, can I get a go chief? A second one I cut this out. Thanks for listening to the Retirement Roadmap Podcast by SHP Financial. If you've enjoyed today's episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button so future episodes are automatically downloaded directly to your device. And if you've liked what you heard, please share the show. Create your own little ripples so we can help even more people with their retirement goals. If you want access to all past interviews, including notes, resources, and exclusive content from SHP Financial, visit shpfinancial.com forward slash podcast. Thanks again for joining us on the Retirement Roadmap Podcast. And for all the attorneys out there, disclaimers and disclosures, I'm just going to put on my super serious voice and add our own. No statements made during the Retirement Roadmap Podcast shall constitute tax, legal, or accounting advice. You should consult your own legal or tax professional on any such matters. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Our investment advisory services are offered through SHP Wealth Management LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Insurance sales are offered through SHP Financial LLC. Our advisors and insurance reps may offer clients advice and or products from each entity. No client is under any obligation to purchase any insurance product.